Hi, everyone. Um, I want to talk about constrained type families this afternoon. Um, so so this, this paper is maybe a little bit different than some. So in a lot of ICFP papers, we start out with some problem. Then we think really hard and maybe, hopefully, come up with a solution. So the chronology behind this research is different. The solution actually happened 12 years ago. <laughs> we'll see what I mean in a few slides. So that's been sitting around, sort of unlit a little bit. It's a little dark there. Um, and then problems accrued, I think. There they go. Um, so some problems came up. And then we had to think really hard to figure out that that solution was the solution to that problem. Um, and, and then, in fact, illuminated the solution a little bit more. So this, this paper uh, has two main contributions. Uh, the first is the discovery that GHC assumes all of its type families are total. I don't expect necessarily you to understand what I'm saying there yet. We'll, we'll flesh that out. Um, and then also, actually, this, this work provides the first proof of type safety for system FC that, that has both non-termination and nonlinear patterns in type families. So there's been a lot of papers that, that talk about this proof, but each cleverly danced around having both of these features, even though both of these features have been present in GHC for years. Um, and on the way, we have simplified the meta theory. So, but before we get any further, let me give an introduction to type families, because um, not everyone has used them. So I, when I say type families, that's the same thing as type functions. That's the Haskell word for type functions. And though this talk is in, based in Haskell, the results, the, I, the ideas that, that I'll present would apply to any language that has both partiality and type level computation. And in fact, Scala has both of these features and already has constrained type families, although they didn't know what problems they were avoiding by having them. <laughs> so here's our, our, our first example of um, uh, of a type family. So it's that, that LM here is the type family. Um, so here, this, this collects class describes collections. So C is a collection, and every collection has some element type. And so we're going to say that, that, that LMC, if C is a collection, LMC is going to be its element type. Uh, and we can make empty ones, and we can insert items into these collections. So these might be two instances of this class. So the li a list of A is a collection, and its element type is A. Uh, we could think of a word as a bit string, and its element type can be bool. So, right, so it doesn't just have to sort of unpack something, but th this, these are two examples. Um, now, here, when I say that type lm list of a equals a, that's introducing a new equality axiom into Haskell. So now every time I say lm list of a, that's identical to a as far as the Haskell type checker is concerned. But that, that equality axiom doesn't really tie into the class. Right? That, that equality, lm list of a, doesn't mention this collects class anymore. So we can lift it right out. Um, and we can just have this type filling at the top level, and we can declare top level type instances. Um, and, and we can still use it in, in, in the class there. Now, if, now, once this escaped out of classes, um, you know, Haskellers like to get devilish ideas and, and thought, well, maybe we can do some type level computation with these things. And I know there's much more modern ways of doing this these days, but let's not get all modern and complex. So we can have a simulation of type level uh, natural numbers, and we can have a pred type family that, that um, uh, takes the predecessor of a number. Um, but this is a sort of a funny way to do functional programming. We have all of these type instances. They can actually be even in different modules. That's not the way we like to write functions in our functional programming language. So we like to actually write things that look more like functions. And so along came closed type families. Um, and so this now allows us to have several different equations. They're tried in order. So notice the second equation here doesn't specifically say z, just the predecessor of anything that's not successor is just going to be uh, the identity function. Um, OK, so that's the, those are the, the features of type families that we need to, ha to have in our heads. And our, our new old idea is constrained type families. And I say it's an old idea because this is, exactly as this is exactly how type families were first explained in the original paper 12 years ago. They were not implemented this way, though, because we thought we had a better idea. Um, so, um, so before I can explain what a constrained type family is, let me give you two definitions. So I'm going to use the, word, the, the term ground type to describe a type that mentions no type families anywhere. So something like int or list of bool. Um, a total type family 
is one that, if it's given a bunch of ground arguments, will always lead to another ground type. So, so essentially, we'll always evaluate. Um, so in constrained type families, in this new model of type families that we're proposing, um, and I should say right now, this is not implemented. Do not look for this in GHC. Um, one of the reasons, though, is, is that I expect some aspects of this to be somewhat controversial, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation that this starts. Um, so here, all partial type families are associated. So those top-level type families, those are going to be gone now. Um, and if we want to use an, a, a, a type family, we have to have the class constraint available. So right now, we don't need that class constraint, but we're proposing that, in fact, you do want that class constraint. Um, so let's, let's look at an example. So here I have some type family F. It might have instances, doesn't really matter. And say I want to thwack an FA to a, to a maybe A. Um, so today, this, this is accepted, but tomorrow, with constrained type families, this would be rejected um, because it, it violates these rules on the previous slide. Um, and so instead, we would need to have a class CF that would enclose F. CF is, is the class for F. Um, and so now it's associated. And then we have to take that class constraint and put it on our type signature for THWACK. And so now we can only use FA when we have that class constraint around. Um, and so this would be accepted under the constrained type families scheme. Um, so why do we want this? What's wrong today? And so this relates back to, to that, that, that contribution I talked about a while ago, saying that GHC assumes all type families are total. So we're going to go through a series of examples showing how this assumption leads us down the wrong path here. Um, so let's, let's look at um, type family FA again here. And, and let's say in this case that there's no instances of this. Yet I can write this X. Now, in my view of the world, that's not really a type there. I said f int, and yet there are no instances for this type family f. So in any sort of model of what this f might mean, I don't really know where it's going from here. I don't know what f int could possibly be. And yet, GHC likes it. Um, and so this, you might think, well, gee, that's not really so bad. You couldn't really ever make use of this. But what this means is that we're not getting the errors that we want to get. We might build this elaborate type family system describing, um, I don't know, units of measure and types. Um, and then when we do something wrong, GC will just accept it instead of giving us a nice error saying, F is not defined at type int, which would be a much better error. Um, so um, instead, if we, if we put this into a, um, into, a, into a class, and now, it's, now it, we're sort of moving toward this constrained type families idea, we get this nice error message. So int is not in the domain of f. We don't have any definition here, and so we get no instance for cf int. So that's how constrained type families would prevent us from writing this bad code. Here's another example. So closed type families through its ordered equations allow us to do equality comparisons on types. So notice in the first equation I've repeated the variable a, and so it's checking if the two arguments to eek t are the same, then I'm going to reduce to car. If they're different, then I'm going to reduce to bool. And I might write a function that looks like this. And so here I'm checking does a equal maybe a. Um, and in the body of my function I'm saying false and, and of course, this should type check, because A does not equal maybe A. Um, and so if A does not equal maybe A, this type family says that that should reduce to bool. And so false is of type bool, so this should type check. But GHC doesn't like it. And lest you think that this, be, that this is a, a strange example that I just cooked up, this is actually bitten. In real life, we, got, we have bug reports saying, why doesn't this happen? And bug reports from people who use Haskell at their business. This problem stops people from making money. <laughs> we want them to do that with our functional programming languages. Um, so I don't actually have any changes to suggest to this slide. Eek t here is a total type family. Uh, and we'll see in a moment why, this, why uh, the constrained type families fixes this. But even without any changing any code, in the future, if we had constrained type families, we could modify the way closed type families work to, to actually accept this code. So why is that? So the problem is, is that I can define this strange beast. So this maybes type family, if we give it an argument, any argument, 
it will evaluate to an infinite nesting of maybe. So when I ask, does A equal maybe A? Well, maybe it does. <laughs> and so GHC today rightly doesn't reduce this because it's worried about the fact that maybe someone will write this maybes and use it somewhere, and then in fact A will equal maybe A. So, so GHC is, well, I'm not sure, so let's, let's not reduce. And that's the correct behavior, and if we did reduce this in, in GHC today, we could get a seg fault. Um, and, and so that's bad. So continuing with this maybes creature, we can imagine writing this at the term level. So let's think, what type would that have? Well, it would have to have a type that equals maybe of itself. But if we try to ask GHC, GHC gives us an error saying that we don't have infinite types such that A equals maybe A. But that's ridiculous. We clearly do. It's right up there on the screen. <laughs> right? So this is, this is terrible. Why, why can't we just infer the type? It's right there. Um, and so at this point, some of you are thinking, well, gee, this language is ridiculous. Let's just get rid of this maybes construct and go home. Um, but sometimes we, we need to have non-terminating computations, or sometimes we need to have computations that are not obviously terminating, at least. Um, and so it's hard to rule out maybes, right? That's, a, that's very obviously bad, but maybe we have something that's not as obviously bad. Um, so let's go, let's go back to this example. So under constrained type families, now, oh, now look, now it's in an instance of some C maybes. And this instance has to depend on itself to be able to use maybe A on the right-hand side there. Because of that dependency, there, there, we won't ever be able to satisfy this constraint. And so, indeed, GHC is now correct in rejecting my justs because it's not going to quantify over an impossible constraint. And so, now it still rejects this. That's good. But rejecting this is the correct behavior. Um, so, what all these examples all connect with is that GHC is making this implicit assumption of totality. Every time we write a type family in a, in a Haskell program, GHC is assuming that somewhere deep down there's a type in there. But there isn't, as we've seen. Um, and so having constrained type families fixes this assumption. So why does it fix it? It's because we're, we're, we're now being more honest. By, by restricting, by having that class constraint, we're effectively restricting the domain of what the function might be called on to the area where it actually is defined. So now there's no assumption. We know that it's defined there because of the class constraint. Um, so using this, when we formalized this, we discovered that the proof became much easier than it's been, and we were able to keep both of these features, which have been battling each other for years. Some papers say, let's assume that there's no nonlinear patterns. And some papers assume, let's assume, some papers say, let's assume everything terminates. And that's the only way we've been able to make progress for years. And so now we've fixed that problem. Um, so there's, there's two wrinkles in this, in this story. The first is, um, is that some type families are total. So we saw an example of that with eek t. And we still want to have those, and we still want those to be top level. Um, of course, discovering what's a total type family is a little bit hard. Um, and right now, GHC has a termination checker, which you can turn off with undecidable instances. And lots of people turn off all the time because it's very weak. And so maybe we can improve that. Um, another wrinkle with this, I'm, I'm proposing to remove a very vastly used feature. Um, but uh, it turns out that we, ha we have a good story around that. It is easy to infer these constraints in a backward compatibility mode if we were to implement this idea. Um, to deal with closed type families, we would need to implement closed classes to mirror the, the different pattern matching behavior of the closed type families. Closed classes are a, a simplification of instance chains that remove some of the features of instance chains that have been hard to implement. Um, details of all of this are in the paper. Um, an open question here is forward compatibility. Um, so you heard this morning that dependent types are slowly marching toward GHC. Um, and so <laughs> how does this interact with dependent types? Um, and and so, so this, is, this is still something we have to work out. For example, if we have a case match in a type, might that need some kind of constraint? I think it would. Um, another question, as I alluded to, is how do we do termination checking in a world where we have the type in type axiom? But maybe that's all going to be okay because maybe under this scheme with constrained type families, Girard's paradox, which, which provides non-termination when you have type of type, maybe that's not encodable anymore. I don't know. We have to, we have to do more work. Um, so uh, to summarize all of this, so we have constrained type families. What do they do for us? They let us escape the totality trap. 
they allow us to avoid usage of bogus types like that f int when f had no equations. Closed type families are now more powerful because they don't have to worry about the possibility of these weird infinite type phantasms. Um, we can simplify injective type families. I haven't talked about that in this talk, but uh, anyone who's familiar with the injective type families feature in GHC knows that there's various, very strange restrictions, and all of these restrictions can be removed. Um, we can remove an unnecessary feature. Now that we have a lot of the open uh, type families, the top level open type families, are actually could now be better expressed as closed type families. A lot of them really are total, um, and so they could be either expressed as closed type families or if it's not closed, if it's partial, then you usually need a class constraint around anyway to use it. So I'm going to say that the, the top level open type families are unnecessary. This greatly simplifies the meta theory. I've done a lot of meta theory of system FC, and this is much easier than anything else. Um, and through that simpler meta theory, we can now actually prove type safety. So there may be some pain with removing this used feature, but I think it's worth it. And so with that, I'm happy to take your questions.